the introduction. My topic today is supercapacitive swing adsorption, which is a new gas separation technique which we have developed at Lehigh University. Supercapacitive swing adsorption is meant as an alternative to pressure and temperature swing adsorption, where you have a high surface area material and where you adsorb <coughs> gases to that high surface area material at either uh, low temperature or high pressure and dissolve it at uh, uh, low pressure or high temperature respectively. So in contrast to that, in supercapacitive swing adsorption, <coughs> we do not actually uh, change the temperature or the pressure. Instead of that, we actually adsorb and desorb by capacitively charging and discharging an electrically conducting high surface air material such as a nanopause carbon material. So why would we expect that there is a change in adsorption properties when we actually capacitively charge and discharge such a material? <coughs> well, the adsorption properties of a material, they depend on the electronic structure of, of the material. So when we actually capacitively charge, then we actually either add or subtract electrons from that material. That means that we actually change that electronic structure, and in turn, we would actually expect that the adsorption properties of that material should change. So to test that hypothesis, we have first built a parallel plate capacitor. So we have uh, prepared a nanopause carbon monolith and connected it to a current collector uh, on one side and left actually uh, an air gap between this uh, carbon material and the counter electrode on the other side. Then we applied a high voltage. We went uh, up to uh, five uh, kilovolts and, uh, and uh, investigated whether there actually would be a change of adsorption properties. Unfortunately, in that approach, we did not see a change in adsorption properties, and we thought this may be simply because in a parallel plate capacitor, you have only uh, a very limited number of electrons that you can actually introduce into the material, and therefore uh, the limited number of electrons in the material would not lead to a measurable change in uh, adsorption. <laughs> so we modified our approach uh, somewhat we thought about how can we actually uh, <coughs> increase the number of charges that we would introduce into our material. And you can do this actually when you uh, switch from a parallel plate capacitor to a supercapacitor. So in a supercapacitor, your electrode material is in contact with an uh, electrolyte that contains ions. So when you charge your capacitor, each electron that you actually inject here is counterbalanced on the pore surface by uh, a counter ion that actually comes from the electrolyte. And for that reason, you form a so-called uh, electric double layer on your pore surface that leads to much higher capacitances into a much greater number of uh, electrons that you can actually introduce. <coughs> so using a supercapacitor for our approach, however, poses an additional difficulty. The pores are actually uh, expected to be filled with the electrolyte. So given that, how can we actually still uh, achieve gas adsorption? So we believe that <coughs> actually this picture of a nanopause car material with completely filled port is actually uh, not quite the core picture, because in a nanopause carbon material, you actually have a random structure with different uh, surface functionalities on the pore surfaces. Some would expect it to be hydrophobic, for instance, CH functionalities. Some would be expected to be hydrophilic, for instance, carboxylic acid <coughs> or carboxylic acid functionalities or keto groups. Now, uh, capillary forces are only attractive if the surface properties uh, are, are actually correct. So that, in reality, we would actually expect that we have actually filled pores that we would actually use to produce the capacitance next to empty pores that we could actually still use for the uh, gas adsorption. So, um, to test uh, that hypothesis, we have uh, set up the following uh, relatively simple experiment. So we have 
uh, you see here a gas adsorption cell. It has about uh, 100 uh, milliliter volume. This uh, cell is half filled with uh, a sodium chloride electrolyte. So you see two electrodes here. These are uh, 3.7 grams uh, nanopores carbon monolithic electrodes. One is completely submerged. This is actually our counter electrode, which we consider to be uh, uh, isolated from the gas phase. The second electrode is actually partially submerged. So this electrode would be accessible for um, the gas. <coughs> so furthermore, you see here a gas inlet and a gas outlet. Uh, this way you can actually fill this chamber with gas. We have actually used a mixture of 15% CO2 and 85% nitrogen. Nitrogen, this gas mixture resembles um, um, a simulated flue gas uh, gas mixture. So furthermore, um, you see here a pressure sensor is attached. So this pressure sensor uh, senses uh, possible adsorption. Um, as we would actually apply a voltage with a DC power supply um, to our carbon electrodes. So if there is a significant uh, uh, adsorption occurring, the pressure should actually change. <coughs> so now we have uh, measured, therefore, the uh, pressure uh, inside our gas adsorption cell as the function of the applied voltage. And you see the result uh, here. So you see, whenever we actually uh, charge our uh, capacitor, then the pressure actually drops by several tors. When we actually discharge the capacitor just by uh, short-circuiting uh, um, the, the wires, then you see that the pressure actually bounces back to approximately the original value. And you can do this over, over multiple cycles, and the measured pressure changes they uh, remain about uh, approximately um, uh, constant. This can be done at a quite low voltage of uh, one volt. So having established uh, this uh, uh, result, we were interested in the question, is this technique actually scalable? Uh, <coughs> so we have changed the mass of the electrodes. We went to electrodes with a larger mass and with a smaller mass, respectively, and measured the pressure changes. We observed that the uh, pressure changes scale actually proportionally with the mass of the electrodes. Furthermore, we were interested in the voltage dependence of this um, effect. So therefore, we have run uh, cycles between 0.5 volts and 1.2 volts. So you see that the pressure changes actually change by an order of a magnitude. At 0.53 volts, your effect is only 3.2 tor. At 1.2 volts, we have a pressure change of 30.4 tor. <coughs> so in addition, we were interested in the question, um, how much energy do we actually use during uh, such an uh, adsorption half cycle? We, uh, you see that actually. Here, so we see there is a significant increase of energy that we actually used uh, during the uh, charging um, of the capacitor. However, when you actually look at the ratio delta P, the pressure change over E, then you see that this ratio also increases. And that actually indicates that we are actually operating more energy efficiently at a higher voltage. Now, unfortunately, we cannot go higher uh, than 1.2 volts um, in aqueous electrolyte systems, because otherwise you get actually electrolysis. However, with organic electrolyte system, you may go, you may be able to go to significantly higher voltages up to approximately five volts. In addition, um, we were interested in the question: um, What is our gas selectivity? Are actually both gases in our gas mixture equally uh, adsorbed, or is there a gas selectivity? So to find this out, um, we actually have um, done uh, gas chromatography at the beginning and at the end of each uh, half cycle and measured the gas uh, composition. Now you see that uh, at the end of one half cycle, the uh, gas composition is changed by about 6%. 
So this means that the gas composition has actually changed from a 15% uh, CO2 content down to approximately 9% uh, CO2 uh, content. So in the, di in the discharge step, we see that the CO2 content actually increases also by approximately 6.1%. That uh, shows that the adsorption is uh, actually, actually reversible. So in addition to that, we did a control experiment in pure nitrogen. And we actually found that in pure nitrogen, we actually even see a slight, even though very small, pressure increase as we actually charge. And that means that N2 uh, may actually be repelled from the electrodes when we actually charge, while CO2 is actually attracted. <coughs> so furthermore, we were interested in the question, what is actually the size of the supercapacitive swing adsorption effect in chemical equilibria? And to find that out, we have actually prolonged the cycle time until we would not uh, observe any more pressure uh, changes. And um, you can actually calculate um, the number of moles of CO2 that you have actually um, absorbed from this pressure change when you actually know the volume of your uh, container and you can correlate uh, these moles of adsorbed CO2 with the mass of the um, electrode material. From, and this way you can actually calculate adsorption uh, capacity for the supercapacitive swing adsorption um, effect. This is um, for a 15% CO2, 85% N2 mixture, uh, 40 millimoles per kilogram at 1 volt and 50 millimoles per kilogram at 1.2 volt. We can also ask the question, what is the effect when we, you actually use pure CO2. <coughs> we found that then the pressure changes are actually increased. However, they are actually disproportionately slower, uh, smaller than what you would actually expect. Because you increase actually the CO2 partial pressure by about a factor of six. However, you see that the pressure changes increase only by a factor of two. And this means that the uh, technique is actually relatively insensitive to the partial pressure of the CO2 in the, in the gas mixture. <coughs> so when you uh, actually, com you can also compare the uh, sorption capacity of the supercapacitive swing adsorption effect with the native sorption capacity of this carbon material. That is actually the uh, amount of CO2 that the uh, nanopause carbon would naturally adsorb. Um, you can measure this uh, in a simple CO2 isotherm, and you see actually that the values for supercapacitive swing adsorption are smaller. However, they are not that much smaller than the native uh, uh, sorption capacity of uh, the nanopores carbon. <coughs> so furthermore, we were interested in the question, what is actually the energy efficiency of an adsorption-desorption cycle? And <coughs> To figure this out, we have actually coupled a supercapacitive swing adsorption experiment with a so-called galvanostatic charge discharge experiment. So in a galvanostatic charge discharge experiment, you charge the capacitor at a constant current, okay, up to the desired voltage, which is in our case one volt. And then actually the uh, area underneath the charging curve multiplied with the current gives you actually the energy that you have used to charge the capacitor. So now what you can also do is uh, calculate the uh, area underneath the dis discharge current, multiply it with the uh, current that gives you the energy that you actually regenerate when you actually discharge. So that gives you a charge discharge efficiency, which is at 10 milliamperes 40, about 42 percent. When you actually charge at a smaller uh, current, you see that the charge discharge curves become more symmetrical and your energy efficiency goes up to 74 percent. When you again calculate the number of moles that you actually absorb and uh, 
and refer this to the amount of energy that you have actually used, then you can also calculate the amount of energy that you have used to reversibly adsorb one mole of CO2, which is 104 kilojoules uh, per mole. So finally, we were also interested in the temperature dependence of the supercapacitor swing adsorption effect. So we measured uh, um, our pressure changes at 26, 40, and 55 degrees Celsius at 1 volt and 1.2 volt, respectively. You see from the curves that the supercapacitor swing adsorption effect is uh, fairly independent from the temperature. At 1.2 volt, you see, however, an, an, an not something unusual. Um, because at higher temperatures, after the pressure goes down, it begins actually to go up. And this is actually more pronounced uh, at, the, at the highest temperatures. So probably at 1.2 volts, you already start to have electrolytic decomposition. And that means that you actually produce uh, uh, gas. That is also further uh, indicated by the fact that at the beginning of the experiment, your pressure is actually higher than in the at the end of the experiment, your pressure is actually higher than in the beginning of the experiment. So finally, we were also interested in the question, can we do such experiments only in aqueous electrolytes or in also in other electrolytes? So we also did preliminary experiments in ionic liquid. And you see qualitatively the same as we actually charge our capacitor, the pressure goes down. As we discharge the capacitor, um, our pressure uh, goes up. So that brings me actually to the conclusion that we have uh, discovered a new electrical effect, the supercapacitor swing adsorption effect. It is able to separate uh, carbon dioxide from nitrogen, potentially also um, other gas mixture, as this effect may not be unique to carbon dioxide, actually. It can be uh, observed for different electrolyte systems. It, can, it actually increases with the voltage, and it actually uh, decreases disproportionately to the uh, CO2 partial pressure. It also barely decreases with uh, the temperature. So at the very end, I would like to thank our sponsors, the DOE RPAE, as well as the Pennsylvania Nano -com Commercialization Center. I also thank my collaborator, Dr. Moore, as well as our uh, students and postdocs, uh, Paitush Mahanti. Uh, Bernika Kokoska, Song Liu, and uh, Nina Jara, and I thank you for your attention. Okay, I believe we have time for one. There you go. In the formation of your uh, carbon electrodes, uh, are you using commercial ones or are you making them yourselves? Uh, we are using commercial BPR carbon uh, powder. We mix it with a binder, mm. and then basically the binder holds the carbon particles together, and that gives a monolithic electrode of cylindrical shape. My experience with carbon electrodes is that some of them have a metal component built into them, and I wondered, uh, you know, this, I'm just talking about commercial ones. Uh, and I, so from what you're telling me that you don't have that uh, deleterious component that would be there in commercial uh, electrode formation, correct? That, that may be. I believe that activated carbons can contain traces of, can contain traces of metals. So we might still have traces of metals in our electrodes, but traces only. So if, if uh, at that early stage, have you compared uh, different uh, electrode uh, preparations to see if their behavior is virtually interchangeable? Uh, so far, we have actually uh, only worked with uh, these monolithic electrodes that I have described. However, we are beginning to transition to, um, well, thin electrodes, because from thin electrodes, you would actually expect uh, a better kinetic behavior, both with, with respect to the charge and discharge, as well as the adsorption and, 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 and des desorption. Well, my, my question, I understand the direction you're taking. My question is really directed towards the 
uh, inconsistency or the randomness of variability of starting materials that may affect your results. So in other words, different formations of carbon may lead to different performing, uh, different electrodes that perform differently. That was, that was my whole question. Okay. 